بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وافضل الصلاة وتم التسليم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين رب شرح لي صدري وسلي عمري وأحل العقدة من لسانة فوق قولي نويت تعلم وتعليم وتذكر تذكير نفع انتفاع والإفادة والإستفادة والحث على تمسك بكتاب الله وبسنة الرسول صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم ودعاء الهدى ودلالة على الخير ابتغاء وش الله ومرضاته وقربه وقوابه سبحانه وتعالى وبه إليه حدثنا حميد بن مسعد البصري حدثنا عبد الوهاب أملك الله تعالى قال الله صلى الله عليه وسلم ليس بطويل ولا جسم وكان شعره ليس بجعب ولا سبط أسمر اللون إذا ما شاء يتكفأ. So if you look at the second tradition here, the tradition and the authority of Sayyidina Humayd ibn Mas'ad al-Basri, rahimahullah ta'ala, Abdul Wahab al-Faqafi, likewise of Humayd, and likewise Sayyidina Anas, rahimahullah ta'ala, the rawi of the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, once again it looks at the stature, like the height of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that the Prophet kana rab'atan, and we mentioned yesterday rab'atan, that the three rewires that describe the height of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which symbolizes the leadership of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa sallam, rab'atan marbu' wa aqwa min marbu' sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The hadith of Sayyidina Anas yesterday, the first of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, rab'atan, and the hadith of Sayyidina Anas, as we see here, rab'atan. Likewise, also the hadith of Sayyidina Barai bin Azib, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, marbu' and likewise the hadith of Sayyidina Hindi bin Abi Hala, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, min al-marbu' okay, that the Rasul is not of average height, although the hadith, the tradition here says he's of average height, but the Prophet is taller than average. And the Rasul would always tower over those who the Prophet walked alongside, although they were considered to be extremely tall in height. And we mentioned it as an example yesterday, Umar ibn Khattab, and Ibn Rijal as we said, he's of those who were six. Measurement Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab. Min al-Makhattateen, they called Makhattateen. Makhattateen is that when they now mount a horse or they mount a camel, their feet touch down. And so when the camel moves, it draws lines inside of the sun. That's what they call the Makhattat, the line drawers, due to the extreme height that they had. And one of the shukh of our age, Sheikh Ali Juma, he measured Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab at nine foot three. Sayyidina Umar was nine foot three in, in height. Radiallahu anhu wa ta'ala. Hadith in Sahih Muslim that Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab is walking alongside the Prophet Sayyidina wa sallam, holding the hand of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he's turned to the Prophet Sayyidina wa sallam, saying, Ya Rasulullah, baby, I love you. Hadith of Mahabba, of loving of the Prophet Sayyidina wa sallam, it being the ruh of Iman, it being the, the, the life force, the soul of faith in and of itself. Somebody who's bereft of the love of the Prophet Sayyidina wa sallam, they're bereft of life. And the more love, you have of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the more living uh, you are. And so it's the Prophet I'm showing Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab that his, his love conditional, you do not believe until you love me more than your parents, you love me more than your children, you love me more than the entire humanity, you love me you love me even more than what is between your two sides. To which Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab, you are now convinced and with conviction, he repeats that to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the word of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Al-An Ya Umar, Al-An, now, now you love, that's love now, Shuf. Umar 9 foot 3, and we're saying abstractly, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, above 6 foot 3, abstractly Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but if you were to be gazing upon the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and saying Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu, an, walking hand in hand with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Rasul taller than him. Hakada the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa sallam. And as we said, that part of the Malakut, the, 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 the angelic nature of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And don't get it wrong, not that the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from the angelic realm, rather the angelic realm from the Nabi, from the light of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa sallam. Laysi bi tawil wa la bi qasir. As you know, he's not tall, nor is he short. Nobody's physique was more 
handsome, more beautiful, alayhi wa sallam, as in the tradition, you have Qatada, ma arsal Allah nabiyan qat illa hasan al wujuh, illa hasan al wajj wa hasan al sawt. Allah Ta'ala has never ever sent a prophet, save that to be an extreme sent a prophet, save that they hasan al wajj, wajj in the Arabic language means facially, wajj in the Arabic language also can mean physically, yeah, physically, countenance. Say that they're beautiful facially, they're beautiful physically, they're beautiful in terms of voice. Likewise, your prophet, Sayyidina Qatada Rahimahullah Ta'ala says, the most beautiful facially, the most beautiful physically, the most beautiful voice, Sallallahu Alaihi wa Wasallam. That's why when you read the biographies of two great companions, one of them is saying to whom? Sayyidina Dihya bin Khalifa al-Kalbi, radiallahu anhu wa ra. Yeah, Sayyidina Dihya is so beautiful, Jibreel transmutes into his form. We'll see at the end. Yeah. Sayyidina Dihya, Al-Kalbi, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. The second of them, you look at Sayyidina Jirir ibn Abdullah al-Bajli, second of them. Yeah. Both of those two companions in their biographies, they describe as the most beautiful after the Messenger of God. After the Messenger of God. And so the Imams, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, say, well, how can Dihya and Sayyidina Jirir both be the most beautiful after the Messenger of Allah, Sayyidina Wa Sallama? They say, Sayyidina Dihya, the most beautiful facially, Jarir, the most beautiful physically, in terms of physique. Yeah, he's sure. And he's saying, you know what I mean? Saying him, saying, saying Jarir, radiallahu anhu, wardahu, that was a specimen, yani. that was a physical specimen. Yani, to, to gaze upon the form of Jarir is ibadah. So, what about gazing on the form of Muhammad? Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Saying Jarir, radiallahu anhu, wardahu, he's only Muslim, roughly 50 days before the death of the Prophet. He said, Look at me, say that he smiled at me. Why? Because in Mal in Sahih Muslim, in Allah Ta'ala Jamil Yuhibu Jamal. Allah Ta'ala beautiful loves beauty. I said, Rasul smiling at beauty there, Jarir, radiallahu anhu, wardahu. That's why you see the beautiful riwayah in, in the age of Umar ibn al Khattab. They're the lover of the Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sayyidina Umar, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, would summon Jarir. And he would say to Jarir, Jarir, ya Jarir. Jarir means take off your clothes. So for Umar, I can take off your clothes. And so Jarir would take off his clothes, and then he would cover his aura. Just take off his clothes, but yulqi ala aurati. Then he would throw his thobe over his aura. And Sayyidina Umar would look at him and smile. So I smiled at the one the Nabi smiled at. <laughs> I don't smile at the one the Nabi smiled at. To look at you, yeah, Jarir. Jarir was a specimen, physically. But bad Rasulillah. Uh huh. Hassan al Jism, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Wa sallam. Yet if the Renaissance man is trying to quote unquote to be the architect of the beauty, the beauty of the physique of man, sure, they have not yet seen what beauty is. They do not know, yet know what beauty is. That the Nabi, so of Hassan al Jism, Sayyidina Husayn al Anas, radiallahu anhu wa rahmah, is saying about the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Wa sallam. وَكَانَ شِعْرُهُ لَيْسِ بِجَعْرٍ He says, yani, yani, وَكَانَ شِعْرُهُ لَيْسِ بِجَعْرٍ وَلَا بِسَبْتٍ That his blessed hair was neither extremely curly nor straight sahih. Because someone could mistranslate it here by saying, وَكَانَ لَيْسِ بِجَعْرٍ wasn't curly. We know his hair is curly. So by جَعْرٍ here, they mean جَعْرٍ القطط. As was saying, Anas clarified in the tradition yesterday, it's not of extreme curls. He doesn't have Afro, like kinky hair. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam doesn't have that. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. But as we've seen the hadith of Sayyidina Ali, that is, he, hadith, his hair is ja'ad. لا يشك في ذلك أحد. Nobody doubts that the hair of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is ja'ad, as we'll see, inshallah ta'ala, as it become even more clear. So don't misunderstand the hadith. If you read in Arabic, translation makes it clearer. But that's not what it says in translation. In translation, that it wasn't curly, nor was it straight. But by curly, it is meant that it wasn't extremely curly as is mentioned here inside of the translation, mashallah ta'ala, asmar alone. This, subhanallah, akad al says, subhanallah, that big, al faqih's opinion, gross mistranslation, gross, a gross there. And we, we have to be careful of that, yani. And the, Ibn Hajar al-Haytami, rahimahullah ta'ala, we'll mention the tradition so you get it in context. Here's a context. Ibn Hajar al-Haytami, the great Imam of Mecca, rahimahullah ta'ala, he says that whoever says the Prophet وسلم, was Aswad, the Dukla Tim Arabic, Aswad, you can translate Aswad as black, Aswad, Fakal Kafar, then they've left the fold of religion. Shayna Sayyidina Hussein Ibn Hajar Rahimullah Ta'ala, the issue is not being black. The issue is to, to misunderstand 
and to attribute to the Rasul وسلم, a complexion that is not the complexion of the Nabi وسلم, that they're problematic. يعني. Now, this hadith, so we get the point. And again, if we're trying to sort of try to understand our own meanings and translate and point our own meanings, then that they're not proper. يعني. It's not proper. It's not proper, and we will say it's not proper. يعني. We translate in accordance to what the Imams, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, gazed upon the Prophet وسلم, no better. And so Sayyidina Anas uses the word there, Asmar. Anybody who understands the Arabic language, لا يشك في معنى, they're not, not going to misunderstand what the word Asmar means. It's Kalam Anas in Arabic. Asmar alone. And usually for the Imams of Sayyidina, so you get the point, this is a tradition they find difficulty in. Because everybody knows what Asmar means. Everybody. So they say, Kaif. How is the Nabi Sayyidina Asmar? Where's the Kalam of Sayyidina Anas? The Prophet وسلم, in terms of his, his complexion is going to be, def, it's going to be de, um, described maybe in three overarching ways. And we can include a fourth. But three overarching ways from the Kalam of the Sahaba. Overwhelmingly, the Rasul is going, to be, is going to be described as being Abiyad. Abiyad alone. So we have to now face Abiyad. That's not the first complexion. Then the second complexion of the Nabi وسلم, Abiyad Mushawish bin Humra, Abiyad Humra, too. Okay? The third complexion of the Nabi وسلم, described here, Asmar. Sayyid Anas, the second tradition, who Asmar alone. Remember, this is the first affirmation of the complexion of the Nabi, Asmar alone. Okay? The fourth complexion of the Nabi, which is not a description of the Sahaba, but Muqarrir min Qibl al Sahaba, that is what it is. It is a. Um, corroborated by the Sahaba, is that the Prophet is Adam alone, which was negated, Adam. Remember, Sayyidina Anas negates that he's Adam. But the fourth tradition that the Tabi'i, rahimahullah ta'ala, he comes to whom Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Abbas and Abdullah ibn Umar, and he says to them in the Haram of Mecca, that right now, last night, I saw a dream. I saw the Nabi, sallallahu alayhi inside the dream state. And so whom... Adam alone, Adam, which Sayyidina Anas negates yesterday, Adam alone. And so Abdullah ibn Abbas said, had you seen the Prophet Sallallahu you couldn't have a more perfect description. You couldn't have a more perfect description. But that's, remember, that's the Ra'i. And that can have its own meanings. But in terms of the eyes of the companions, either the Abiyad, either the Abiyad Mishawish bin Humra, or Ariz, or Ariz, or Ariz, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as far. This there is sort of rifled the Faqir, yani. how are you going to show off? Why, why you do that, yeah? And mashallah ta'ala, brothers, the brothers are blessed who translated the, the work, yani, but shof, translate what it says in the Arabic language. And so the Prophet says, Abiyad Allah, what is the meaning of Abiyad? And one of the great works in Mantiq and logic inside of our tradition is called the Sulam al Munawrak. Imam al Akhtari, rahimahullah ta'ala. Imam al Akhtari is trying to, is trying to clarify in the beginning of the Sulam, the use language. And terms, how they indicate meaning inside of the Arabic language. And terms can either indicate a meaning that nobody disputes what that means. Or they can indicate Okay, we understand? And so the Imam Rahimullah Ta'ala, when he wants to give you an example of a term that can only ever be understood in context. What does he use? The Imam al Akhtari, Rahimullah Ta'ala, great Imam of the school of Imam Malik, Rahimullah Ta'ala, he uses the term Abiyad. So now, Abiyad, it's a term in the Arabic language that it cannot be understood except in context. And so when we see the term Abiyad, which will be used in over 14 different traditions, Sahiha, that are sound, that attribute this yani, yani, Bayba to the Prophet. Okay? The only way you're going to translate that, the, the Abiyad, from Abiyad alone, is that the Rasul is fair. So the Rasul has some fair skin. What, what does it mean to be fair skin? In the, hadith, the tradition of saying that the Rasul is not be Adam, but be Abiyad al Amhaq. You got the two. Race, black, they have fair skinned people in the car of the dominant of their people. Everybody has that. Okay, you have people who are fair that in skin in the context of what is that dominant complexion. Not open for doubt that the Arabs were a dark race. 
Qad Ayad, rahimahullah ta'ala, Qad Ayad inside of his shifa, his words are Qad Ayad, some say the greatest imam ever written inside of Shamal. He said the Arabs were a black race. He used the word Sudan, yani Aswad. They were a black race. Those were around the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now that there is giving you a context, definitely giving you a context. The Rasul is fair in the context of those people, yani. You with it? It's fair. And it must be understood. Yani, because Allah Ta'ala Alam, yani, 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 many of us, for whatever reason, and the Fakir is not here to go to go to debate reason, yani, but many of us, we've been raised and reared with racist mindsets as it relates to the complexion of human beings. How can we been raised? So we see human beings through race through like a racial visa, yani, a racial prism. That day, the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has no room for. You know, Bedouin in Sahih Bukhari comes to the Prophet وسلم, he's fairer in complexion. And so he says to the Prophet وسلم, in Bukhari, he says, my wife, Zeniyat, my wife, she's committed adultery. And so he says, the Prophet وسلم, says, like, why? Why why, 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 why committed adultery? How do you know? What's your proof? Yeah. You come and accuse your wife. You come and do that. And so the, he says to the Prophet وسلم, because she's just given birth to a black child. And you used to do it as well, the child black, dark hairy. So the Prophet he says to him, Look, Shuf, we have um, we have two red cows. How, how, how can so the camels give them birth to a red camel? How, how can two brown camels give birth to a red camel? The Prophet I'm asking the bedroom, right? Speak to people in the corner of their own mindset. And so the man says that the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because the forefathers were red. The forefathers at the point were red. The Rasul, ha ha. Move on. Jagal, yani. Jagal, la. It's in Bukhari. So the Bedu understands. Understands the issue of race here. Yani, how race manifests, yani. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But the color of the Arabs, yani, that day, so. And we could go into and it's couldn't be cutting at all, yani. We go into it extensively, but that very clear from the works of the Imams Rahimahullah Ta'ala. Now I'll point to because a long story short that the Rasul sa Abyad Mushawash will humra. Okay, we'll give you a definitive. What does it mean, Abyad? We said it's fair in the context of his people. Then the humra can be understood in different ways because they're trying to say redness. What does it mean? That the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa sallam here fair with some redness. And if he subhanallah, I'm having a good opinion, but I'm I'm saying like where that I'm trying I'm trying to see yani. like where that yani? Have we not read the hadith here or what? Yani, I'm not seeing how they've translated it that way, yani. I'm not seeing it. Although what I do understand that the Imams do find this tradition a bit problematic, yeah. Someone said, How is he asmar? I said he was asmar. Remember, Anna also says the soul is Abiyad. Now, Anas can't be speaking about two different complexions, can he? So, what do you mean by Abiyad? Give you Abiyad. Great, knowledgeable Imam after the prophets. Who said the most knowledgeable man after the prophets? The prophet Sayyidi the Son. Speaking about. So, if you look at the Bible, you say the Ma'ad ibn Jabal. Ma'ad ibn Jabal, yani, he, he's, he's, his complexion is Abiyad. Like I said, Abiyad. Really? Then they describe his hair. Then they say his hair is Ja'ad al Qatat. You know what Ja'ad al Qatat means? Huh? He mentioned it yesterday. Ja'ad al Qatat is sub Saharan, kinky African hair. So he's got the kinkiest of hair, African hair, sub Saharan African hair, but he's described as Abiyad. What do you think? What does that yod mean? I'm trying to say. You ever seen somebody with that type of hair? That what we're not saying, and no one's ever said that saying Muhammad ibn Jabba was like albino. He's not albino because that's one way you know that he's an albino, but he's not an albino. What we're trying to make sure you understand that the word abyad has a ma'ana, it has a meaning in the context of the Arabs themselves. And it's just somebody of a fairer complexion within the context of their people. Okay? When you say Mushawash will humra, the great Imam Al Lahji, Abdullah Al Lahji, Rahimullah Ta'ala, the Shaykh Sayyid Muhammad Ali Al Maliki, Rahimullah Ta'ala. In his commentary upon Nabahanis, we spoke about Muntah Sul. Al Lahji, Rahimullah Ta'ala, says, Ma'ana, 
the meaning mayumil ila uduma. It's what is now tending towards being Adam. That's Abdullah Lahji, rahimahullah ta'ala, in his commentary of the early mashallah, was commissioned by the great Sayyid, Sayyid Muhammad Ali al Malik himself, rahmatullah ta'ala alayh, that will be published and spread inside the age, and which within and some of the most read books, the commentary of Allah, Abdullah Lahji, the great Imam Allah Lahji in Yemen, rahimahullah ta'ala, on the complexion of the Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallama. Shuf, you're good here? Yeah? Yeah, subhanallah, we ask Allah ta'ala for tawfiq. That day, we have to make this idrak of it. The drug, subhanallah. It's the drug. Subhanallah, the fakir, yani, one of the shuk of Asad, huge. I won't mention his name for reasons. What the huge shuk of, 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 of Ibn Asad was teaching about, about the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so he's speaking about the complexion of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the Fujit, I was taken aback. I said, How do you say that? Yani? So the Shaykh, he says, huge, well respected, subhanallah, Shaykh of Asad. And so he's saying, he's saying, look, and so you just, are you, are you going to get the word? He said there are two types of people in relation to the Prophet Sallallahu and they describe the Prophet Sallallahu There are those who describe the Prophet Sallallahu in a way that's inappropriate for the Prophet Sallallahu And either their intention is to attribute deficiency to the Prophet Sallallahu and if that be their intention, فَقَدْ kafar, they've left the religion. He said all their intention there is what is يعني, to him, um, uh, is not to to attribute deficiencies to the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for khat fasaq. And so thereby it's sinful. Hakkad he says. And so then he says, like an example. And so here he sort of wants to echo Ibn Hajar, Rahimullah Ta'ala. He says, as an example, somebody who says, the, in Arabic now, somebody who says the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is Aswad. You said that, isn't it? Or Asmar. Sure. Uh-huh. So he says, he says, he says, whoever said the Rasul is Aswad or Asmar, then it depends what was your intention. Was your intention to, to attribute deficiency to the Nabi, or was your intention not to attribute deficiency? But you said the word that's not attributed to the Nabi. What, what then is he saying? First thing he's saying, right, is that Aswad and Asmar mutaqariban. They're very close in the Arabic language. You sure? Now we're not saying, don't mess me up, but I'm not saying, I'll give you an example. I'll give you a personal example. Once the fakir is. And so I'm, I'm. Jordanian man enters and he sees me. Shuf. And obviously, I'm strange in his life. <laughs> in his eyesight, I'm a bit strange. Really. Shuf. And so he screams out to the fakir. He, he screams out, screams out to the man. Ya Aba Asma. Ya Aba Samra. I can't he says. He uses the word Asma to describe my complexion. I haven't got the point. Like that, they're similar, similar, like the N-word in English language. That Akadar was, you are You obviously didn't go right forward and straight after that, but it was, it was what it was. Yani. But the point, what the Fakhir is saying is that no one's going to dispute what Asmar is. Even from our shiuch themselves, this hadith, they're like, whoa, what the hadith mean that the Rasul Asmar alone? Because it's the only time he's described as that, by Anas, Rahimullah. All I want you to make sure. We all understand what Asmar is. The Shaykh there of Asmar, Ghalat. Ghalat, yani. That is wrong. This is whoever said the Rasul was Asmar. Because Anas said he was Asmar. Uh, what are you going to do? Tunaza Anas, Yawm al Qiyamah? You're going to argue with Anas on the Day of Judgment? Kayf, yani. Araftum, but the Fakhir, the mistake he made, Allah Ta'ala, in the Fakhir's eyes, was not about the word Asmar. He's just using the word Asmar as a synonym of the word As Aswad. That's why how he's using it. Not trying to question what Anas attributed to the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbi wa sallama. We all understand, sure, we all understand, like if you gaze upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallama, and if you look at the Arabs today, the, the, the loan of the Arabs today, the loan, the color that we see the Arabs today, so we get it. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallama is on the darker side of that spectrum. Today, in his age, he's on the lighter side of the spectrum of the Arabs. But in today, when you look at the Arabs, they like if you look at like, and I'm talking about the, the, the southern Arabs. So you look at the Arabs who are inside of Mashallah Ta'ala, so in Saudi Arabia, or the Arabs inside of the Yemen, the Rasul on the darker side of that spectrum. Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alaihi wa Sahi wa Sallama. Araftum, wa bihada nadeenu Allah. It's with that, yani, we, we worship Allah with Subhanahu wa Ta'ala with certainty of that. Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alaihi wa Sahi wa Sallama. If people, example, many of you are familiar with Tareem, yani, with Tareem. 
and the imams and the complexion you see inside the tarim. You know, mashallah, the great imams is, 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 and the great women in, who passed this week. Yani, mashallah, the week that was just gone. Habib Mashor, we're speaking of Habib Mashor. See the complexion of Habib Mashor? That's a darker Arab, isn't it? Everyone saw Habib Mashor. That's a darker Arab in our day. How can Habib say that closer to the complexion of the Nabi? The complexion of Habib Mashor there, you, now you're getting close to the complexion of the Prophet. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Wa sallam. So we can get context here. If someone wants a context for complexion of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So we apologize, but that fujit, and I'm like, hey, yeah, yeah. Anyway. And when he walks, he would walk swiftly with vigor, and the Prophet Sallallahu and he would lean forward. It's going to be the entire chapter upon how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam walked. وَبِي لَيْهِ قَالَ حَدَثْنَا مُحَمَّدِ بِنْ بَشَارِ يعني يعني العبدي حدثنا محمد بن جعفر حدثنا شعبة عن أبي إسحاق قال سمعت البراء بن عازب رضي الله تعالى عنه يقول كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله وصحبه وسلم رجلا مربوعا بعيد ما بين المنكبين عظيم جمة إلى شحمة أذني علي حلة حمراء ما رأيت شيئا قط أحسن منه so the hadith here of saying Muhammad ibn Bashar, yani an abdi, yani narrated towards that Muhammad ibn Ja'afa narrated towards Shu'ba, narrated towards on the authority of Abu Ishaq. We said, I heard saying Barad ibn Azib radiallahu ta'ala anhu say that the messenger of God sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahi wa sallama was a man of medium stature sallallahu alayhi wa sallama. His blessed shoulders were broad. Ba'id ma bain al mankibain. Remember, when you're describing the Prophet وسلم, like physically, you've always got to think of a bigger physique. Like everything about the Prophet is big. He's, he's a bigger man in terms of stature. And so when he hears, or Wasi Sadar, two ways it's going to be described. It's going to be broad shouldered, broad chested, as you see in Sallallahu Likewise, here, عظيم الجمة إلى شحمة الأذني that the Rasul صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم عظيم الجمة as here and here that he had a full head of hair that would reach his blessed earlobes okay sound a جمة in the Arabic language it can what it can be um, it can be used for the length of the hair of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم but it can also be used for the thickness, like has been correctly translated, the, the thickness of the hair of the Prophet Ordinarily, it's used for the length, okay? And so the Rasul Sallallahu his hair can be what's called wafra. That's wafra. It can be limma, or it can be jumma. Jumma to his shoulders. So ordinarily, when the, the word jumma is used, it means to his shoulders. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahi wa sallam. Illa, except here in, They've defined Jumma and, it, and it's saying a bara as defined it as Shahmatul Udunay. This is Shahmatul Udunay, the earlobes. And so the earlobes, ordinarily in the design of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's where the, the back natural hairline, natural hairline, which of the hair, you'd call that hair wafra. Wafra, you'd call it. But well, here say bara calls it jumma. So by jumma, it doesn't mean length. Because jem in the Arabic language means profuse. So it means profuse. Either Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam here, as I mentioned, that he has what? A full head of hair. Like full, yani. Imam Muhammad Abdul Hay, Rahimullah Ta'ala, he says for every strand of hair the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has, it equates to a prophet. And so we know that in excess of 124,000, 224,000 prophets, Rasul got hair, yani. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahi wa sallama. Okay? That the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallama azimu jumma ila shahmatul udhunay alayhi hullat al-hamra He was wearing two red garments. Okay? Hullat al-hamra. Hullat in the Arabic language is like what we call a suit. Okay? Where the word, the rida, the upper garment matches the word, the izar. Those two blessed divine garments. And he saw, he sees the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallama wearing hullat al-hamra. A red garment. By red, it's not meant khalis. It's not meant absolute red. To wear absolute red in the deen of Allah Ta'ala, makru, and it's disliked to wear that. And the Rasul is a Muslim in libas ahl al-nar. It's from the clothes of the people of hell, yani. To wear red, a red garment, khalis, pure red, not broken up by other colors. 
And so when it's attributed to the Prophet ﷺ by saying Abara, Rahimullah Ta'ala, what it means, because overwhelmingly, if not exclusively, the clothes of the Prophet ﷺ were from Yemen. And so Hekka, the garments of the people of Yemen. So they pinstripe, a striped garment. Where if you, I was to ask you, what color is this? You're going to speak about maybe what the dominant color is, isn't it? What the dominant color in terms of stripes. So the Rasul Sa'ism had a, a garment like this, like the people of Yemen, that the stripes were dominantly red. But not exclusively. Everyone got the point? Uh, it means uh, Salah Ali Wasallama. And the two garments was a rida. The rida is the upper garment. And likewise, the izar. And the izar is the lower garment that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wore. I have never seen anything, any mayor or ayatul shayan qat, more beautiful than him. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallama. وَبِئِ إِلَيْهِ قَالَ حَدَثْنَا مُحَمَدِ بِنْ عِبْنِ غَيْلَانِ قَالَ حَدَثْنَا وَكِيَ حَدَثْنَا سُفْيَانَ عَنْ عَبِي إِسْحَاقَ عَنِ الْبَرَاءِ بِنْ عَازِ بِنْ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى عَنْهُ قَالَ نَهَرَأَيْتُ مِنْ ذِي لِمَّةٍ فِي حُلَّةِ حَمْرَاءَ أَحْسَنَ مِنْ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَعَلَى آلِهِ وَصَحْبِهِ وَسَلَّمَ لَهُ شَعْرٌ يَضْرِبُ مَنْكِبَيْنِ بَعِيدَ مَا بَيْنَ الْمَنْكِبَيْنِ لَمْ يَكُنْ بِالْقَصِيرِ وَلَا بِالطَّوِيلِ This is Mahmoud ibn Ghaylan. Rahimahullah Ta'ala rates on the authority of Waqi'ah and the authority of Sayyidina Sufyan. Sufyan de Thawri, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. Sufyan al Thawri. Yani the two Sufyans in the Ummah, Sufyan ibn Uyayna and Sufyan al Thawri. Imams of the same generation, Radiallahu Ta'ala anhum, Wardahum. Yani, MashaAllah, Tabarakallah, al Thawri inside of Basra, Yani, and al Uyayna inside of Mecca. Although, but they would often meet inside the Haram. المعاصران يعني، so let's go to سفيان، سفيانان، the two سفيانز. ولكن إذا أطلق سفيان، but if it does say سفيان، it means ثوري يعني، ثوري the greater of them in stature with الله سبحانه وتعالى. although عيين ابن عيين the great، يعني ولو لا ابن عيين سفيان ابن عيين في مكة ومالك في المدينة لا ذهب علم الحجاز. if it wasn't for سفيان ابن عيين huge in مكة and even Malik ibn Anas, who we read in the first tradition yesterday, in Medina, the knowledge of Hijaz and Mecca and Medina, the Haramain, would have disappeared. They were two gatekeepers, radiallahu anhu wa rada. But Sufyan al Thawri, greater than Sufyan ibn Uyayna, rahimahullah ta'ala, yani in terms of stature. Okay, but this is the transmission here. Yani saying that Sufyan, rahimahullah ta'ala, ibn Uyayna, who's yani of the Shuk of Imam Shafi'i, rahimahullah ta'ala, likewise his student there, Waqi'ah. يعني عبد الشيوخ في إمام الشافعي رحمه الله تعالى يعني وكيع بن سليمان هو إمام الشافعي immortalizes إن الشكوت إلى وكيعين عن سوء الحفظ فأرشدني إلى ترك المعاصي I complained to وكيع about my bad memory and he told me to what to abandon all disobedience the famous poem of الشافعي رحمه الله تعالى أنا سفيان عن عن أبي إسحاق أنا البراء بن عازب بن رضي الله تعالى عنه قال ما رأيت من ذي لمة في حلة الحمراء أحسن من رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله وصحبه وسلم. He says here, يعني سيدنا براء رحمه الله تعالى. I've never seen anyone who's here reached between his earlobes. Okay, يعني between his earlobes. I've never seen anyone who's here reach between his earlobes. Earlobes and shoulders, whilst wearing two red garments, more beautiful than the Messenger of God, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He had some. Yani wa sahbihi wa sallam. So here. Uh, saying the bara again, speaking about the beauty of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. First and foremost, I've never seen anyone whose hair reach between his earlobes and his shoulders. And as we said, that's limma. Okay, wafra is to your natural hairline. Limma, as been described here, is between your natural hairline, the earlobes, and your shoulders. And then jumma ordinarily is what now reaches your shoulders, which is ordinarily the length of the hair of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But he's describing now the hair of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi. While Ali was so I'm saying the bara of the Imams of the of the Ansar Rahimullah Ta'ala, and obviously his description of the hair of the Prophet is Madani. The only time you're gonna ever gonna say the hair of the Rasul Sallallahu which are the two traditions of saying Abara ibn Azib, who min sikhara sahaba, is from the youngsters from amongst the Sahaba Radilla Anu or Dahu, and so saying the bara that he's gonna describe the hair of the Prophet Sallallahu in both of these two traditions, Bad al Nusuk, after the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Has made Umrah 
or Hajj, most likely in this case after Umrah. Remember the first time the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam is ever going to touch his hair. Touch his hair sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Sixth year after Hijrah. The sixth year into Medina to Munawar. Sixth year after Hijrah. 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 Sixth year Okay, because he described it to the natural hairline, and then thereby he's describing it now between the natural hairline and the shoulders. So the hair of the Nabi, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, growing back. And he wearing in two red garments as described, who is more beautiful than the Messenger of God. Never seen. And you see saying Ali, wa yaqulu wasifu, ma ra'aytu qablahu wa la ba'adhu mithlahu. I can say saying Ali, rahimahullah ta'ala will say, that whoever describes the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will say, I've never seen before or after anybody the like of him, anybody more beautiful than him. Sallallahu Alaihi wa alihi wa sahi wa sallam. He had some hair that reached down to his shoulders. Okay, down to lahu sha'ar. Sha'arun yadribu man kibay. And so that, that there now, the more normative description of the hair of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi wa alihi wa sahi wa sallam, which now brings in an issue of, of him, of him. It's, it's as if there's a contradiction. In the in the statement of Baran, there's no contradiction. Uh, but again, you could misunderstand it because the limma and the limma, the limma being translated here as between the natural hairline and the shoulders. Okay, but then saying the Baran says yadribi man kibay, that his hair is what is now bouncing off his shoulders. Sallallahu That seems like a contradiction, huh? If you speak about length, so in the same way when saying the Baran says shahmu udunay will jum. We have to reinterpret it Jumma because he's coming with the hair of the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Is he not? So Jumma, which ordinarily means shoulders, can't mean that here. Otherwise, there'd be a contradiction. So Jumma now means he's got a lot of hair. That's in the Arabic language. That it's limma, which ordinarily, yeah. Also, he's clearly saying that it's it's, it's bouncing up. It doesn't mean we have to reinterpret it limma, okay? And so limma in the Arabic language is taqarra makana. Uh, limma is taqarra makana. It's when something is rooted in its place. Haven't got the point. So now here the limma, somebody who has strong hair. That's how you don't understand it. I we don't have a single rewire in the source. Now we're looking at the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with Sayyidina Bara, radiallahu anhu wa and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam approaching 60 years of age, minimum approaching 60 years of age. We do not have a single rewire of a single hair dropping out of the, of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's head. This, he doesn't lose one strand of hair. You get the point? And so you want these type of sifat of his hair, that his hair is plentiful, full as described, but it's also strong hair. Rooted, and that's how you do understand limma inside of this tradition here. But then ordinarily, he's also got long hair, long, strong, full. Okay, in terms of the hair of the Nabi, sallallahu alaihi wa alaihi wa sahbihi wa sallama, and he was neither short nor tall. But be lay call hadatha Muhammad ibn Ismail, hadatha Abu Nuaim, hadatha al Masoodi, and Uthman ibn Muslim ibn Hurmuz, and Nafi ibn Jubair ibn Mutaim, and Ali ibn Abi Talib, Rodi Allah ta'ala, and who called. لم يكن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم بالطويل ولا بالقصير شاهن وكفين وقدمين ضخم الرأس ضخم الكراديس طويل المسروبة إذا ما شاء تكف تكف وأن كان ما ينحط من صباب لم أرى قبله ولا بعده مثله صلى الله عليه وآله وصحبه وسلم تحديث من إثارة سينهم علي كرام الله وجهه who reported that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم was neither tall nor short and his blessed hands and feet were fully fleshed and steady, okay? Shethno kafein wa qadamein, which is a difficult word to translate in the Arabic language, which again always requires context, because the word shethn in the Arabic language ordinarily means rough hands. Somebody whose hands are rough, okay? As you know, someone, the hand, they are very, very manual hands. But that's going to be negated. It's important and it's difficult to contradict Anas, Rahimullah Ta'ala, when he says, Ma to wala harira alya in kafin Nabi Sallallahu I've never touched silk or brocade that was smoother than the kaf, the palms of the hands of the Prophet. Remember, in terms of the damage, the human damage, the human skin, 
Okay, the palms are the roughest part. And so he's describing, quote unquote, the roughest part of the hands of the Prophet Sallallahu being then he's softer than silk, smoother than silk. Saying Anas with the hands of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so the Imam says, so we've got to reinterpret Shethan. So now then what does Shethan mean? Because Shethan ordinarily means you've got rough hands. And so the Imams, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, they're going to say, you cut يطلق البعض على الكل that ordinarily people who, who are manual, who have rough hands because of the, the, the physical usage of their hands their hands become strong and steady and so what we're saying is that the way it's translated mashallah, that's how it's understood okay. that's how we just let the Yeah, and the hands and feet were fully fleshed in, in understanding these terms. And I'm the most difficult to try to explain specific terms because they're difficult for Lughat al-Arab. Yeah, some of the terms used to describe the Prophet وسلم, have never ever been found inside of Arabic dictionaries. You can't find them in dictionaries. They verify terms that the Sahaba عنهم, were using to describe the rarefied reality in the Bil Awam. And so Shafan, one of them. So if you took And so now you must go to a move around here of Sayyidina Ali Karam Allah head was large, Dakham, Mulhama. His hammer, which is his forehead, was Azim. It was great. The Rasul size him, you know, he's a you know, large bone, but the joints are big, and he, he broad chested, broad shouldered, but eight men made Bain al Mankibay. But all of this is proportional to each other. Everyone got it? The proportionality is very, very important as it relates to the Prophet so that he's not misunderstood. Yani, his form is not misunderstood. So like he had Dakhmar Ras. Yani, yani his, yani the Prophet وسلم, his blessed head was large, as were his joints, Dakhmar Karadis. And the Karadis are the major joints. It's about shoulders, elbows, knees. That's what we call the Karadis, the major joints inside of the human body. And he had a thin line of hair that ran from his blessed chest to his navel. That is called the Mesruba. Just one line of hair, Sayyidu Wasallam. Otherwise, as you see, we're saying a Hind Ajrad. If you look at the Prophet, Sayyidu Wasallam, your first glance, you say he's free of bodily hair. There is no hair upon his body, Sayyidu Wasallam, except one line. That's called the Mesruba. That's what we call it, Dhu Mesruba. Sallallahu alayhi wa sahi wa sallam. You get closer to the Prophet, Sayyidu Wasallam, like really close, then you can notice a bit of hair here with the Prophet, Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, bit of hair. But at, but at, a, at a normal distance, you say Ajrad. As Sayyidina Hind calls him Ajrad. That he's completely stripped of bodily hair, Sayyidina wa sallama, dhu masruba, where everybody affirms this thin line of hair that is upon the stomach of the Prophet, Sayyidina wa sallama, from his chest to where his navel would have been. Because of the Imams, Rahimahullah ta'ala, they negate the Prophet, Sayyidina having a navel, Sayyidina wa sallama. Because as we know, as in the hadith of Hakim and others, that the Rasul, Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, sallam yani he was born without umbilical cord. I mean, it's, it's the umbilical cord, is what remains, that's what creates the, 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 the navel, the belly button. But the Rasul Sallallahu born without umbilical cord. No umbilical cord, no placenta. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallahu wa sallam. Hakada. And mut'oom min qibla al-haq, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. First from the divine, subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the womb and beyond the womb. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam. So he had a thin line of hair that ran from his blessed chest to his navel, quote-unquote, when he walked, he would lean forward slightly as if descending 
a height, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa sallam, all of that we would expand further in the chapter of walking. I saw, I saw neither before him nor after him anyone like him, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, wa sallam, wa bi ilayhi qala hadathna Sufyan ibn Waqiyah, hadathna abi, yani hadathna abi, an al-mas'udi bihad al-isnaid nahuhu bima'na, Sufyan ibn Waqiyah narrated with my father and narrated with the authority of al-mas'udi, who narrated a similar report with this chain of transmission. وَبِهِ لَيْهِ قَالَ حَدَثْنَا أَحْمَدِ بِنْ عَبْدَةِ الضَّبِّيَ الْبَصَرِ وَعَلِي بِنْ حُجِرْ وَعَبُ جَعْفَرْ مُحَمَدِ بِنْ حُسَيْنِ وَهُوَ إِبْنَ أَبِي حَلِيمَةِ وَالْمَعْنَى وَاحِدٌ قَالَ حَدَثْنَا عِيْسَ بِنْ يُونَسْ عَنْ عُمَرِ بِنْ عَبْدِ اللَّهِ مَوْلَى غُفْرَ ممغط ولا بقصير متردد وكان ربعة من القوم ولم يكن بجعد القصر ولا بسبد كان جعدا رجلا ولم يكن المطهم ولا بالمكلثم وكان بوجهه تدوير أبيض مشرب أدعج العينين أهدب الأشفار تليل المشاشي والكتد أجرد بو مسربة شفن الكفين وقدمين إذا مشى تقلع كأنما ينحط من صبر وإذا تفت تفت معه وبين كتفي خاتم النبوة وخاتم النبيين أجل الناس صدرة وأصدق الناس لهجة أليانه معركة وأكرمه معشرة من رأوا بديهة هابة ومن خالته معرفة أحبة يقول ناعته لم أرى قبله ولا بعده مثله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم Hadith Ibrahim ibn Muhammad from the progeny of Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu ta'ala anhu wardahu and it related or narrated to me. And I mean, Walid is Sayyidina Ali. And it's not Ibrahim who's the son. Because in Arabic you can say the Walid is either the son or it could also be the progeny as correctly translated here. Like the, the Walid. Although the son of Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib is Muhammad. Ay, Ibrahim, the grandson of Sayyidina Ali, whereas Muhammad, that's Sayyidina Muhammad al Hanafiya. Radiallahu anhu wa imam of the tabi'een. And it is son of Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib to a woman from Banu Hanifa, from Banu Hanifa, the Naj there. I, I, not from the Salala of Sayyidina Fatima Zahra, alayhi salam. Okay, this is Muhammad al-Hanafi and this is his son, the grandson. Sayyidina Ali karam Allah hawajuhu. And Sayyidina Ali karam Allah hawajuhu was reported of having said that the Prophet Sayyidina was neither tall nor short, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa sallam. His blessed hands and feet were fully fleshed and sturdy. His blessed head was large, huh? I'm reading the wrong tradition. Yeah. It was Sayyidina Ali, Afwan, Karam Allah, Hayawajju. When Ali ibn Abi Talib, the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi wa sallam, wa sallam, he would say that the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi wa was neither extremely tall, extremely short, He was of media stature. He was neither curly nor straight. Rajil also means that his hair was well groomed. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rajil. And rajil. And rajil in the Arabic language, kind of jadan rajila. Okay? And so what they've sort of did here was slightly wavy. Again, they've translated it in terms of meaning as opposed to the exact way to say Ali ibn Abi Talib. So Sayyidina Ali says jadan it was the rajila well groomed. Everyone got the point? And so that kind of the exact meaning of the two terms are saying Ali Karam Allah Hawaj will use. Clearly, oh, I'm imagining that the Prophet As you can see, like the you know, the hair curly, but the Prophet hair as well, and the second of his combs is called the musht. Wherever he is, he always has two combs. And so the midra the Rasul uses وسلم, to pick his hair, because his curly hair وسلم, to entangle his hair, as you would say, to pick his hair. After picking his hair, وسلم, then 
the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is going to saturate his hair in oil, in olive oil, saturate it. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as we see the tradition, can the thobu thobu zayat. It's as if that it, the garment that he has, that the garment of somebody deals with oil, sells because it's oily, the garment. What garment is that? Doesn't mean it's clothes. That's to be misunderstood. It means the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wears sunnah to wear the likes of a what? Of a durag. It's like some of our sisters wear hijab. They're going to put something around their hair first and foremost before they put on the hijab. That's their sunnah. So the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam knows that. He's going to tie something around his hair. Now it's called the qina. It's called the qina. Imam Tinri will have a chapter, Bab al the chapter of the Kina, like the Durag that the Prophet wears upon his blessed head, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That Kina, that garment saturated with oil. Because the Rasul has used it as like a protective head covering to protect his turban or the like from being soiled, which is going to be very important, okay? Because when we get to the chapter of the turban of the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and he, they're going to try hard, often they're going to try hard to try to say that the Prophet Sallallahu as an example, had a white turban. I mean, we have no hadith that he ever wore white turban. None. The hadith, he wore black turbans. Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alaihi wa Sallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But they're going to try hard. So there's going to be a hadith which says the, the turban of the Rasul Sallallahu was desma. You get the point? And so they're going to use desma. Some of them, they're saying desma means the, the turban was white. But desim in Arabic languages can be translated as oil. Desim. So it was white, but it was soiled with oil. Again, the imams are going to say, that's not going to happen. If you see someone walking around with a turban that's soiled with oil, for an example, you're going to say the person's not taking care of hygiene, taking care of cleanliness, is it not? Is it not? And the Rasul says, in the nawafa min al iman, that cleanliness, orderliness, it's of faith, yeah, and it's a cornerstone of faith. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, as the Imam say, La yakun. Rather, desma is a synonym of soda, of black. He wears black turbans. That's sunnah. To wear black turbans. Then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We all got it? And then another thing which negates him having a soiled turban, what we're saying here, he has a kinar. He wears a garment on his head that protects his turban from becoming soiled with oil. That's, that's the whole point. The Imams want to make clear here. And so, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallahu alayhi wa And so, the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's hair was jad. Then, after saturating his hair in oil, then the Rasul uses his second comb, which is the musht. Now, he's going to groom his hair with the second comb, the musht. So, now the hair has become very loose. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then it becomes rajil. Rajil in the Arabic language, same way we get rigil, legs. Same way we get rajul, man. Huh? What does it mean? Upright. So when you say someone's a rajul, it means they're upright. That's rajul, a man is upright. And that's why, you know, Aisha can a rajilan. Aisha was a man. What does it mean Aisha was a man? Aisha, she was upright. You get the point? Upright. Profound. How can Aisha is described in her biography? Upright. On the rigil. To the legs. What does it mean? Upright. Straight. So the, the combing, the grooming of the hair of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is straightening out his curls. That's what Rajil means. He's straightening out his hair. Like the process of combing your hair is to make your the curls, if it's one with curly hair, straighter, looser, straighter, straighter. So by the time the Prophet has now finished grooming his blessed hair, Sallallahu Alaihi to kasur. And that's what they've got here, wavy. You've seen all the breakages, which he translated as waves, in the actual hair of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alaihi wa Sallam, where well, his hair starts one way and ends up another way, Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alaihi wa Sallam, but the process is very, very important. Jadan Rajila, the term, it was clearly well-groomed, Rajil, okay? Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alaihi wa Sahbihi wa Sallam. He was not corpulent. Mutaham and his blessed face was not completely circular. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but was slightly round. And so the Rasul said something, he said, we the Rasul said, he had described it, the Prophet doesn't have straight face. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, nor does he have round face. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ibn Gari, neither or. Overwhelmingly, Banu Adam, the human being, like everyone in this room, I guarantee you, we've got straight faces, long faces. Okay, that's overwhelmingly the majority of human beings. Their face, I okay, 
The Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam is facial shape different. Uh, facial shape to the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his face approached roundness. Okay, and that, that Khalil and Bani Adam, very few human beings have that. You can find that in the Orient. The Orient, you get the point, amongst Orientals. Uh, they can have that type of face. You can find with specific tribes inside of South America. They can have that type of shape of face. It's not normal. Not normal, quote unquote, inside of what inside of the shapes of the of the human being. But that shape perfect, because that's the shape of the face of the Nabi. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa And his complexion was fair and imbued with a bit of redness. And we've explained what that means. And his blessed eyes were black adaj. And his eye adaj in the Arabic language is like intensely black. And iris. Pupil, cornea, contrasted by intensely white. A contrast Muslim Muslim. Adaj, it's a very specific term in the Arabic language. Adaj al Aynain, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so his eyes were very, very black, what we have to say, contrasted by the whiteness of the eyeballs. And that's going to be important when you want to explain something called Ashkal al Aynain. They're going to say the Rasul Ashkal al Aynain. So they say, what does Ashkal mean? But Ashkal ordinarily means if I look into the, you look at the eyeballs of somebody, you will see the, um, the the red cracks in their eyeballs, see that, the, the redness lines in your eyeballs, that now is called ashkal. And so the Imams Rahimullah Ta'ala want to say, sure, even though it's a fame that is ashkal al aynain okay, you're going to say that can't hold true literally for the Prophet. Sallam. Why? Because it's contradicted by adaj. And they're all going to say his eyes were adaj. Adaj means you don't have those red lines in the whiteness of your eyes. And his eyes white, yani, the balls are white. Yani. Again, indicative of health, isn't it? Health, yani. Rasul, healthy, yani. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, sallam, wealthy. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, wa sallam, in the truest sense of the term, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa sallam. And so, ad'aj, a very, very specific, specific, mashallah ta'ala. And if you get to the eyes of the Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which means, subhanallah, yani, Imam al-Tirmidhi, prima, yani, but Imam al-Tirmidhi, rahimahullah ta'ala, yani, would, that al-Tirmidhi, rahimahullah ta'ala, had the chapter upon the eyes of the Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Like, like in the hair, would that I mean, the eyes, the windows to the soul, would that a Tirmidhi, Rahimullah Ta'ala, the chapter on the eyesight of the Nabi? But obviously, he doesn't. Of the later Imams of Shemal, they'll have chapters upon the eyesight of the Nabi, Sa'ali was fascinating Shuf, to understand the nature of his eyes and the nature of his eyesight. Sallallahu but it's those eyes that are what that are the epitome of beauty, such that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala crafts the eyes of what of the maidens of paradise. And it comes to the eyes of the Nabi. Sa'ad ibn Salama. That's what it called the Hur al-Ain. Hur al-Ain of Jannah. Hur, a synonym of, of white. Hur in the Arabic language means white. Yani. White, wide-eyed maidens. And when you look at the description of their eyes in Jannah to Allah, it's crafted in accordance, mashallah ta'ala, to the standard of the eyes of the Nabi. Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallama. And he mentions... And his eyelashes were long, but the soul size had long eyelashes, and his blessed joints were large. Sallallahu alayhi wa Remember, eyelashes, mashallah ta'ala, are also indicative of the health of eyes. Remember, it's, it's not just an issue of beauty, although with the Prophet, وسلم, it's clearly one of the features of beauty amongst all of those other features of beauty inside of the face of the Prophet. I mean, there's a reason why women would desire long eyelashes. There's a reason why they do that. Shuf, because it's it's symbolic for beauty inside of the animal kingdom. I mean, the animals that have the long eyelashes, they're the animals that are more synonymous with beauty inside of that world. Well, and likewise also amongst Banu Adam, yani, are often, and that's why you see, you know, they often say that the Rasul Sayyidu Wasallama, when you describe his form, his physique, his facial features, you're dealing with Jamal and Kamal, ordinarily they'll say. They usually won't use the word Jalal, but the features of the Nabi are Jamal, and the features of the Nabi are Kamal. Beautiful and perfect. They're not going to use the word majestic. But beautiful and perfect. And his features, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa wa and in terms of beauty, then show off, you know, do women want arched eyebrows? Mm -hmm. And the beard arched eyebrows. Do the women want long eyelashes? Mm -hmm. And the beard long eyelashes. And what you're going to find is that a lot of the features on, of the Nabi, sallallahu wa sallam, are the features that women desire, yani in order to heighten, quote unquote, I mean, women, as opposed to men, men on the side of majesty, women on the side of beauty. In order to heighten beauty, 
women desire inadvertently and often without knowledge the exact features that we find inside of the face of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam. We all got it. And that thing, remember, it's important when you try to imagine the face of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi And don't get it wrong. Please don't misunderstand what's about to be said. Yani, but the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa face yet is beyond the epitome of feminine beauty. Everyone got the point? It's, yani, yani, you're not looking at the face of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and speaking about it in terms of masculinity. Like it's, it, you know, it's beyond, because men ain't that beautiful. Yani, sure. <laughs> the truth be known, yani. That's not where you look at beauty. Yani. Beauty upon the other side, Araftum and the Rasul says and beauty is beyond the epitome of feminine beauty. You understand? Or we don't understand? I hope we, you don't understand. Yani. I'm, I'm trying to adapt with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's what it, it's a bit difficult to express, but I could be clearer, but I think adab, you got to try to understand what we're trying to say. That that beauty is a property that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loads in the feminine side of the world. Yani. And Allah ta'ala creates the world in majesty as well as in beauty. In terms of this sort of this duality of the universe, the polar opposite of the universe, you have masculinity, you have femininity. Not only in terms of literal, but also in terms of metaphorical. Like you say the Arabic language, the Arabic language, it's, what, it's a gender specific language. But gender is not just literal gender. Like man, woman, everything is gender, but metaphorically masculine, metaphorically feminine. Have you got the point? Now, when we speak about metaphorically masculine, masculinity, we speak about here the sifr of majesty, okay? Jalal. And when we speak about yani, feminine. We're speaking about here yeah, in terms of feminine beauty. Everyone got the point? Or we don't get the point. Uh, like have you ever seen it? Have you ever seen have you ever seen a really handsome man? Uh, so I'm not speaking about the beast size, but I'm trying to strike a metaphor. Have you ever seen a man who's really handsome? Like really, they're not normal. I'm saying they're not normal. They're not, they're not normal. But if you ever see a man who's really handsome, yani, really handsome, you're going to notice that, yani, to a person have a beard or what have you, you put a hijab on that person. <laughs> like, you may say, what's going on there? You get the point? That's what the Fakhir is saying. Like, when a, like a man is really beautiful, his facial features tends towards the, the world of femininity. Because the world of femininity is symbolic for beauty. Because Allah Ta'ala created it. Now, we're not saying that's the face of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We're saying it's beyond the epitome of that. But you've got to look in that direction to get a sense of his face. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We all understand? That's trying to be mentioned, inshallah Ta'ala. His complexion was fair. Redness is blessed chest to his navel in his blessed hands and feet were fully flesh and height when he would turn to somebody or it was important that they get into the eyesight of the prophet like when he turned to so, towards somebody he turned to his entirety and it, it, there's a metaphor in that regard is that the prophet if he turned towards you he turned towards you Metaphor, yeah. he gave you his all, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa sallam, whenever he turned towards. That's one of the, of, the, of the most grievous things in the lives of the companions. That he turned away from me. That they're not a good sign. You know, the, 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 the people of Shu'am, the people who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, has decreed fire for. 
that in, the, in that primordial moment inside of the universe, they were those who, when they gazed upon the form of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Hadith and the Musannaf of Abdul Razak, that he had turned away from them. They, they, they saw him from behind, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's not a good sign, yani. sure. But a great sign when he turns towards you. Because he'll tafat, when he turns towards you, he'll tafat man, as you know, Ali says, gives you his all, Sallallahu Alaihi but then also it opens up the bab of his sight because the Rasul that his sight is what's called 360 degree peripheral vision. See, Abdul Aziz al Dabagh, he describes the sight of the Prophet, he calls it Jihat al Amam. So he sees everything from this one direction. And that's why when he he turns, and we don't have traditions of the Prophet Sallallahu turning his head. We don't have that. No traditions. Even the traditions go to the opposite of that, that the Rasul, if he has his rida, he's wearing his rida, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and he's riding a, a beast, like instinct says that never the Prophet Sallallahu The tree takes it, and the Rasul continues to ride, and the Rasul does a 180 degree turn, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam comes back to the tree, and then takes his rida, so Ali was salam, 180 degree ten, and carries on. Shuf, so Ali was salam. Everything from this direction, everything from the single direction, head only turned him, assalamu alaikum, wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. That's the only time he changed his head. So Ali was salam, in nusukh in ibadah. It's like the only time he cuts his head, cuts his head, in nusukh in ibadah. Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. And so when he would turn to look at someone or something, he would turn with his entire body. Between his blessed, blessed shoulders was the seal of prophethood. And he is the seal of the Prophet That'll be explained in the chapter of, 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 the, of the seal of prophecy that is behind the heart of the Prophet on the tip of his left shoulder blade. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. His blessed heart was the soundest and the most generous of hearts. Sallallahu alayhi his speech is the most truthful of speech and he's the gentlest of all people in nature and the noblest of them in social interactions and companionship. Whoever saw him unexpectedly would be all struck. Whoever interacted with him whilst knowing him would love him. The one who would describe him would say, I saw neither before him nor after him anyone like him. Okay. Imam Tirmidhi rahimahullah ta'ala qala Abu Isa sami'tu Abi Ja'far Muhammad ibn al-Husayn yaqulu sami'tu al-Asma'i radiyallahu anhu yaqulu fi tafsiri sifat al-Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahihi wa sallam al-mumaghid al-zahib tula wa qala sami'tu arabiyan yaqulu fi kalami tamaghata fi yani fi nushabatihi ay maddaha maddan shadida wal mutaraddida dakhilu ba'duha fi ba'di qisra fi ba'di qisra قصراً وأما القطط فالشديد الجعودة والرجل الذي في شعره حجونة أي تثنن يعني تثنن قليلا وأما المطهم فالباجن الكثير اللحم والمكلثم المدور الوجه والمشربة والمشربة الذي في بياضه حمرة والأدعج شديد سواد العين والأدحب الطويل الأسفار وكتد مجتمع الكفين والكاهل والمسربة هو الشعر الدقيق الذي كأنه قضيب من صدر إلى سرة وشاثن الغليظ الأصابع من الكفين وقدمين وتقلع أن يمشي بقوة وصبب الحدود يقال إن حضرنا في سبوب وصبب وقوله جليل المشاش يريد رؤوس المناكب والعشرة الصحبة والعشير الصاحب والبديحة المفاجأة يقال بدهته بأمر أي فجأته به إمام الترمذي هكذا his glossary now I'm showing you the difficulty of certain terms I heard Abu Ja'far Muhammad ibn Hussein say I heard Al-Asma'i رضي الله عنه والرأ explain Imam Al-Asma'i رحمه الله تعالى of the students of Imam Al-Shafi'i رحمه الله تعالى said of the greatest lexicographists in the history of Islam Imam Al-Asma'i رحمه الله تعالى and a very famous يعني ما شاء الله تعالى in his understandings and elucidation of the words, the lexicography of the Arabic language. As Al-Asma'i rahimahullah ta'ala explained the meaning of the word mummaghit. Aywa.
That's why we share the deal of Dab. I can't do the for here. And the way it's, the, I, the, the way it's um, translated here in English is the way the Fakhir memorizes the chamber in Arabic. In the text of Arabic, they, they put the Tashdeed on the Ghain. Okay? On the Ghain. In Arabic, it says Al Mumaghit. Okay? With another Nusuk, it says Al Mumaghit. I don't got the Tashdeed is on the meme. Al Mumaghit. Okay? So in, I did. did Transliterated it one way in English, or they'll spell it a different way in Arabic. Is compressed, like we say, a midget, again, that negated from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Khatat, it puts Khatat, means extremely curly. We said Sub Saharan. The word Rajil refers to one whose hair is curvy, okay? That is to say, it is slightly wavy. As for the word Mutaham, it means corpulent, having much flesh. Yani Mukalfam means one with a circular face. Okay, and if I'm going to this about the, negating the, from the face of the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam both terms. And the Mushrab means to one whose fairness is imbued with a bit of redness. Adaj refers to irises that are black. Ahdab refers to eyelashes that are long. Ketid refers to shoulder joints, which means the top of the upper back. Mesruba is a thin line of hair that is likened to a narrow blade that runs from the chest. It means fleshy digits. Ishra means companionship, and Badiha means suddenly or by surprise. It is says Badah to who? Bi Amr, meaning I surprised him with something. Inshallah Ta'ala. We have to stop there. Do you have any questions, Inshallah Ta'ala? Any questions? Do you have any questions, Inshallah Ta'ala? Now you mentioned that Iman isn't complete without loving the Prophet وسلم, more than any other creation. How can one reconcile love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and love of the, his Prophet is the whole point of creation to love the Prophet وسلم, and it, the answer is there instead of your without loving the Prophet وسلم, more than any other creation. Okay, so you should it's about love for creation. So that's not love for creator. Okay? Love for creation. And so we do not love anything. If our love of anything in creation vies for our love of the Prophet, it's a clear deficiency in proportionality of faith. It's a deficiency in terms of faith. But it's Somebody's love of the Nabi وسلم, in creation, superstition, al an as the Prophet now you've arrived at what are the reality of faith in and of itself. Secondly, love of the Nabi وسلم, is love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? And, and, and one who loves the Nabi loves Allah Jalla Jalala wa ta'ala. Ta mustahil, mustahil. It's impossible for someone to love the Prophet and not love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed the Prophet as the object of faith and the object of love. Okay? And that faith being faith in him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. But 
you have to turn towards the Nabi. And that love being love of him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, but that being love of the Nabi, and so we should never see them as disparate. We never create a dichotomy between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet Tawheed. Allah creator and the Prophet as his creation. That they clear, yani. Allah Ta'ala is the creator and the Prophet is creation. But Allah will subhanahu wa ta'ala his love. You get the point? As a way of testifying to your love of Allah with subhanahu wa ta'ala. The... In kuntum tuhibbun Allah we translate it in this way that he love Allah prove that through love of me you must prove your love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through proving your love of me Hakada Allah ta'ala commanding the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallahu alayhi wa Yes. That's in the light, light of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallahu alayhi wa Can you please repeat the name of the head covering of the Prophet Not with the R upon it. Qina. Noon. Alif Ain. Qina. And is there anyone in today's day and age who is said to resemble the beloved وسلم, for example of the awliya or of the family of the beloved وسلم, uh, before the people of Tuamrat or today's closest to how the Sahaba appeared and, it, and it, forgive me and correct me I'm wrong so I was wondering if there are known people who resemble the Prophet وسلم, Allah Ta'ala Alam Allah Ta'ala Alam is saying if there are known people who resemble the Nabi Although we could mention names of people who had said that resemble the Prophet what it means that they resemble the Prophet in what? In part, not in whole. In part, in whole. Like somebody may have the eyes of the Nabi Somebody may have the nose of the Nabi Somebody may have the mouth of the Nabi Somebody may have the hair or the hair texture of the Nabi Somebody maybe has a physique that resembles the physique of the Nabi And so it's an issue of in part, not necessarily in whole. Yani. Is it dislike for women to wear something exclusively red also? Yes, it's dislike for both men and women. And we should be careful that the so-called the clothes of the people of hell. Yani. And we should not be we should not prepare for hell by wearing the clothes, isn't it? Rather, we should prepare for Jannah, isn't it? By wearing the clothes of the people of Jannah. Jannah to Allah. Okay. The question here, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had a cat called Mu'izza. Yep. Is there any wisdom for having a cat? Okay, I heard it's vibration and energy from the cat does something to the human body. Doesn't mean the cat was in the house of the Nabi. Yani sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Rasul 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 sallallahu alayhi wa a secret desire to kill the one who domesticated it. How can they say? If we analyze and cut, your cut in your house is desire is to kill you because you domesticated it, Yani. And you lock it up, and you sure.
husband Abu Talha, Al Hudaybi. That took um, place. They have they still so. A lot of sleeping and waking, do we know from those characteristics? Well, that's what we're discussing now. If someone was to be deficient in the And no further problems. How, where would you advise them to start in order to begin? To love him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and that there is to acknowledge of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we always sort of stress our Arabs, that are very, very important. And Allah Ta'ala, we reveal that as an Arabic Quran, that you may become intelligent. So there's something about the Arabic language that sharpens human intelligence. And there's a reason we need sharp intelligence. As we're going to we'll learn if you, you approach the matter is to understand exactly how he was as soon as it comes out of Arabic by virtual translation. Anybody who translates about the Prophet is dropping in variant degrees. I'm going to understand the Prophet is what is to learn the Arabic language. What about it? To learn the Arabic language, yeah? So you can what? You can become fahim bi kalamillah. You can be fahim. Be sifat al Rasulullah wa akhlaq al Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. You become understanding of the word of Allah Taala and the reality of the Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And advice, inshallah Taala, that inshallah Taala we give. Inshallah Taala, but through knowledge, the great and more quantum leaps in terms of love from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Remember, Allah was subhanahu wa taala every sifat. Every attribute, every attribute of the Prophet is a good reason to love him. Every attribute. So the more those attributes you understand, the greater the love. Every single one. Everyone got the point? Directly proportional, yeah. And so we just ask Allah Ta'ala for tawfiq in that regard. Is there any mention of the nur of the Prophet and being linked to the complexion? Naam, there is, there is. It's, it's, yani, here, I ask him the word, I abyad. It's not necessarily the word abyad, although the abyad, it can be used as an issue of nur, but more so, yani, it's like, you know, it's like we mentioned, hur al hur, they call the hur al We said the hur in the Arabic language, it means, um, of its meanings is white. And so the Imams, Rahim, an example, the example like with somebody, tahiyar, tahiyar from the word hur, and tahiyar, when you become confused. You know, somebody truly confused, like someone you see the, the white, and you just see, you, get, you start seeing what, ha, the hacker of the meaning of the Arabic language, the hawariyun from the hur. And the imam say, why they call the hawariyun? Some of them say literally because their profession, their vocation was to dye textile white in the Jordanian river, they to dye cloth white, the hawariyun, the disciples, hacker in Arabic. The other side, which is more to the question here, because whiteness here, metaphor for the illumination, that they were lumen beings from being in the plains. And so, yeah, it can have that meaning. 
But just to be more sort of precise in the term, we see the Prophet's complexion is going to be Azhar, like Fatima Zahra, the Zahra, radiance. So that term more so alludes to the luminosity of the complexion of the Prophet. You can see him described Azhar alone, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was radiant in terms of his complexion, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Yeah, we understand, we apologize for the the connection issues, yani. and it was the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi hair all one length. Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala knows best, and it was all one length. Yani. Yani, yani, Imran, the question here is: Is it possible to outline the key hadith in each chapter? But if somebody was planning to memorize a couple from each chapter, they could do so and obtain a holistic picture of the Shamal. Inshallah Ta'ala, we will ask the um, we will ask the actual um, admin, inshallah ta'ala, there's a text there which has been a bridge from the Shamal, a hadith, the yeah, salient a hadith from the Shamal, inshallah ta'ala, that students in the second year of the micro madrasa that they have to memorize, they have to memorize. Any traditions, 42 to 50 traditions with Senate, with transmission, inshallah ta'ala. So we'll ask that that be uploaded for those who want to benefit through memorizing. But we would say that you don't download unless you intend to memorize. If you don't intend to memorize, leave it alone. Then, because it's only been it's only been brought to that, inshallah ta'ala, as a means of memorizing, as a means of drawing closer to the Bisa'ali wa sallam. Anybody present have any questions? Mashallah. What books could you recommend to the I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's no thinking. <laughs> Shema'il, how old are you? Nine. Shema'il, the Fakhi would recommend, like our teacher Murab al Hajj, you're still a bit young, but our teacher Murab al Hajj, when he was 16 years of age, 16, so you've got six years to go, when he was 16, he took this entire book, Shema'il of Tirmidhi, and he memorized it one year. One it took him one year to he can memorize the entire book in one night. That's his memory was, is that good. But he took him one year to memorize it because he said, I'm not gonna memorize anything till I'm living the book. So my advice to you at that age, this book, you got a copy of the Shamal here. Is that yours? It's a gift. There's a gift, see? A gift. That's a gift from Wajid. Shuf. Wajid generous today. <laughs> and then now every hadith you read, you've got to try to live it. You get the point? You understand? That read this over and over and over and over again. Over. Okay? By 16 years of age, you should have memorized the entire book. And two, by 16, you should be you should be the walking, mashallah ta'ala, through, through Luton. What's your name? Isa. Muhammad. Isa, isn't it? Yeah, Isa. Now, by 16, you should be Muhammad. Isa, isn't it? To live in the book. You got it? There you go. Any questions, inshallah ta'ala? Any questions? Say again, sorry. Yeah, we're saying because he, he had his, the nature of his vision, he never needed to. The Prophet said, like everything he could see from in front. That's the reason. Hadith in Sahih Bukhari in Muslim, the Prophet said, he said, a timur ruku'a was sujood. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is addressing, you know, people can be, you know, like there are people, okay, that in the presence of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they're going to be on the best, their best behavior. But in the perceived absence of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, look how they begin to slack. And that can even happen in his presence when they, in their deficiency, think that he can't see them. Especially people of hypocrisy, so they can come. Now to Medina to Manawa to the Masjid of the Prophet and then they're going to try and position themselves like behind the Prophet so they're out of sight. In their, in their way of thinking, out of sight, out of mind. Really? So the Prophet says here in Hadith Bukhari Muslim, make sure you complete your bowing when you pray and complete your sujood, your prostration. Bow perfectly, prostrate perfectly. Because I see you from behind my head. Because like, you think I can't see you. So my vision different. From this way, I see you that way. Because like, in Bukhari, Muslim, you understand? 
So he, I, he has, like, why do we turn our heads? Isn't it? We turn our, we turn our heads for the reason. In order to see. You, you come, to, isn't it, Isa? You come to the road, isn't it? And you look. Okay, before you cross, isn't it? You learn that, isn't it? The Rasul doesn't have to do that. You get the point? Sees it all. Just this direction. Rasul just walk across like that. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Alayhi wa sallam. Ala surat al-mustaqeem. Upon a straight path. Sallallahu wa sallam. Naam. Akad the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's like, the, you know, it's like in, 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 in higher symbolism, the Prophet sallallahu described the path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Rasul said it's a straight path. And he drew it. Hadith and Tirmidhi. He draws a line in the sun. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam draws lines to the right and draws lines to the left. And he calls him subul al mutafarriqa So these are the deviant paths from the straight way that lead to Abu Abu Jahannam, the gateways of hell. Looking right, looking left, straight ahead. But by virtue of that, he sees everything. MashaAllah ta'ala, it's higher. At the high physiology, if you only bought new yarn, high. Doesn't get any higher than that. Any questions, inshallah ta'ala? Oh, you silent today? What's going on, Danny? So, any questions? The dreams, uh, the dreams of people in relation to his complexion, not in relation to his complexion, in relation to many things. Just the complexion of is often some something obvious in a human being. But then the, the, the rule, if if they're not seeing his complexion right, they're not seeing other things right. You get true complexion. Like someone inside the dream state. But the Prophet وسلم, al mu'min al mu'min. You get the point. And so al mu'min, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Prophet, وسلم, the mu'min, the mu'min, is the mirror of al mu'min, kullul mu'minina, of all the believers. And so now he, he's like a mirror. So now when we see the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in what can be considered to be an attribution of deficiency to the Prophet وسلم, it's truly an act to the ra'i, not the mar'i. So it's an attribu attribution to the one who's seeing the Prophet وسلم, we're deficient, not the mar'i the one who we're gazing at. You get the point? He's mirroring our deficiency وسلم, as a means of Clarification as the Prophet said, Rahimallahu Unas, Allah Ta'ala Imrin, Allah Ta'ala bestow mercy upon the one who he guides ila uyubi nafsihi. We guides to his own faults. And so the Rasul in the dream state comes often to show us our own faults, our own deficiencies. Hakad is understood. Yeah? But it's not the Nabi. You got the point. It's not the Nabi. The Nabi has a reality, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his form has a reality that manifested inside of this world, and that's the, the, the ultimate manifestation of the form of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa up until the reconstruction of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa to enter into paradise. But up until that point, the ultimate manifestation of the Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa is the manifestation that now Imam Tadmidhi and others describe him as having. Yani. Okay? Any questions, inshallah ta'ala? Welcome. Yeah, the classes, it just depends where we're at. Yeah, and so obviously we're under virtues. And then inshallah ta'ala, I think the admin will allow you or will let you know whatever city we're in that uh, people can are free to attend in that regard, inshallah ta'ala. Yeah, how could yeah, would somebody put the first chapter of Shema'il into practice? I mean, the basis of the khalq, the physical form of a human being, yeah, the, basic, the basis of that, is that it's what it's unchangeable the basis i mean there are elements that we can change that we can mold elements of our khalq yani. but overwhelmingly our khalq our physical form our physical features set by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala okay and that there also in reality as a reflex in khuluq khuluq is fixed all we can do with our khuluq is to control what we manifest and learn how to uh, control what we keep hidden. Have got the point? That's the basis of it. But your character, your character set, yani, are off them. And so the basis maybe of the chapter, how can we put the first chapter, Isa, into practice, is that we use this chapter as a means of love. 
of understanding Kamal and Jamal, so we become people, mashallah ta'ala, of Mahabba. So that, that's the implementation implementation of the first chapter. And again, one of the greatest signs, greatest signs that you're on the path, mashallah ta'ala, to love, it's going well, is now when you start seeing the Nabi. You see? When you start seeing the Prophet in the dream state, that now indicative of somebody now, mashallah tabarakallah. You get the point? That now they're on the path of love. And we, we should we should take that as a it's not necessarily someone who doesn't see the Prophet doesn't love him. That's not what we're necessarily saying. But seeing the Prophet is an indication of what of love. You know, as a, well, you dream, don't you? And who then do you see in your dreams? Like who then do you see in your dreams? Yani? And often what you see in your dreams, they're like the mahal of ta'alluq. They're the mahal of connection and attachment. Even when dreams go wrong, yani, when they go wrong, even in adghaf al-ahlam, bel adghaf al-ahlam, like Allah Ta'ala says, even when they, when they confuse dreams, reflections of our existence inside of this lower realm, the reflections of our connections and attachments inside of this lower realm. We all got it? Uh -huh. And so now, in the dream state, when you start seeing the Prophet that becomes one of the clearest indicators that now you're on the path of love. You're approaching love of the Nabi Taib, inshallah ta'ala. Any more questions? Any pressing questions? Inshallah ta'ala. Taib, jazakum Allah khairan. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sallam.